Thank you very, very much. I am honored by that uh, introduction. Uh, not only because, Nathan, you're a political scientist, you wrote the new history of the province together with Professor Weiser, not only because you're an entrepreneur, but you're the first to introduce me that ever quoted Waylon Jennings. And that might set you apart uh, forever, but thank you very much for the energy that you're contributing to the province and for your entrepreneurship and for Front Runner Technologies that I think we'll be hearing, hearing a lot more from uh, in the future. I want to say at the beginning a number of thank yous. We have uh, great support again from sponsors, uh, and we, we just heard the list of sponsors read, but please consider yourself thanked again by myself on behalf of our party uh, and all of the MLAs. Lee Elliott has chaired uh, an amazing committee of ticket sellers and organizers for the event, a volunteer group. You know, we didn't give them the best sort of political environment to go out and and do the work they've done, and they've, they've, they've put together this wonderful event, and I want to thank them for that. And ladies and gentlemen, I also want to uh, acknowledge all of those who have, uh, vol who have volunteered to make it happen, all of the people at the party office as well. We have Patrick uh, Bundrock, who is uh, our, the executive director of the party, and Kyle Appeal, who's made it happen, and Please give a hand to all the people of the Saskatchewan party and welcome this young lady who's joined us as well to uh, engage in free speech. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, my, my wife Tammy couldn't be with us here tonight. Uh, she is an accompanist and involved in music festival action in the province and for the first time ever, she was chosen to accompany a couple of young women uh, on the piano at a provincial event. It's her first time in the big leagues in Saskatoon, so she sends her best and couldn't be here tonight. I'm, well, sure, thanks. I'll let her know you wished her well. Uh, I also uh, want to thank my political family, and you, uh, you heard from them, or at least you heard their names listed. They were introduced to you. They all stood up and waved. Ladies and gentlemen, the MLAs that are the women and the men of the Saskatchewan party uh, are an amazing group of people. Uh, they have conducted themselves with honor and character and integrity. They're the kind of people that would allow others to speak in an event, for example, even if they didn't always agree with what those uh, speakers or what was happening at that event. That's how we do things in Saskatchewan, isn't it? We may disagree with each other, but we'll disagree with each other with respect and we'll come together in the end and build a better province. And that is the very definition of the Saskatchewan Party Caucus, women and men. And I want to thank them for their efforts. And I know they have been introduced here once, but you know they don't get enough credit, frankly. So I'm going to ask all of them if they wouldn't mind standing in their place all together. If you don't, if you don't mind, we won't run down the list of names again so that we can thank them properly for the work they do as members of the Legislative Assembly and the resolve they've shown to make the right decisions in the long-term interests of our province. So colleagues, if you please stand and ladies and gentlemen, give me, a hand, give me uh, uh, some help in thanking them. Now there's one MLA that couldn't stand up with us tonight. His name is Greg Ottenbright. And he's the member for Yorkton and the Minister of Rural and Remote Health. And Greg has uh, been battling colorectal cancer. Uh, and he's in the hospital tonight, recovering from surgery. Now, you might know Greg. He and his wife, Leon, are amazing people. Uh, they lost their own son years ago to cancer and started a foundation, Braden, Braden's Cuts for a Cure, and they raise thousands of dollars for cancer uh, every single year. And then here recently, Greg was diagnosed with... Uh, with colon cancer and so he's been going through treatments but really not missing a day of work even though when we I actually had to order him to stay home uh, on a couple of occasions because he wouldn't leave last week his, uh, uh, his surgery took place I can report to the room and to his caucus colleagues that haven't heard that it was a success the prognosis 
is very good. And I knew when his surgery day was, so I sent him a text. We're going to put it up on the, on the screen here. So Greg is a, Greg and I both like muscle cars. I'm a Mopar. I'm a Dodge guy. He's a GM guy. He's got a Rally Nova that he's built, and it's a beautiful car, but it's a Chev. Uh, and I had a Dodge uh, Coronet, 1967 Dodge Coronet. I recently had to let it go because I, I was able to get Waylon Jennings' car, and Tammy said one midlife crisis is enough in the yard, and so I don't have the Dodge anymore. But we still have our arguments, Dodge versus GM. So I sent him this text uh, and asked him if the doctors had found any... Uh, Mopar tendencies when they opened them up and they had them on the operating table. Uh, and it was just, I sent the text, it was just when Leon had picked up the phone and as you can see from the screens, Greg was coming out of, uh, coming out of the anesthetic. Uh, and as she says, his sense of humor is still twisted brackets and enhanced by the drugs. And he answered the, my question, yes, as a matter of fact, yes, I now have a hemicolon. <laughs> That's pretty good, ladies and gentlemen. He's just come out of surgery. And so I wonder if you'd help me. We're going to put up his Twitter handle here in a moment. And if you could send him some, some get well greetings, just use the hashtag Mopar or no car or hashtag hemicolon. I think he would, he'll know what that's all about, trust me. And he'll, uh, he'll be emboldened and uh, invigorated by those, by those uh, texts, uh, those, those tweets. I do want to, yeah. I do want to talk about the budget tonight, actually, and I'm, I think our guest has left. Uh, she may or may not want to hear what we have to say about it, but before I do that, I, I, I think it's important to address what has been a contextual or sort of foundational question that, have been, that has been posed by some of our critics and other people in the province related to this year's budget. And the question, it's a rhetorical one by and large, the question is, where did all the money go? Ladies and gentlemen, over the last number of years, our province has benefited from some good fortune, certainly. Not so much in the last three years in terms of revenue, but certainly a number of years where there was solid revenues and performance. And so the question has been, well, where did all the money go given, what, given uh, where, where we are fiscally in the province today? Well, how about we start with tax relief? Six billion dollars in cumulative tax relief over the last nine years, taxes reduced for families, for farmers, and for small businesses. 114,000 low-income people in the province dropped from the provincial tax rolls completely. That's where the money went. And by the way, there's another party out there and maybe we saw a supporter of that other party here earlier on, that used to talk about those people on low income and then tax them at the low income rate. So you can kind of talk about things or do things when the opportunity presents itself. And we're never going back to a day when those 114,000 low income people are having to pay provincial income tax again in Saskatchewan. How about a billion dollars off the operating debt? That's where the money went. $20 billion in infrastructure investment to deal with a structural infrastructure deficit that was left behind in this province. $20 billion in new infrastructure. That includes nine record highways budgets, 12,000 kilometers of road fixed or replaced, and we know that there's more work to be done. The Regina Bypass, the largest infrastructure project in the history of the province of Saskatchewan, saving $380 million over a conventional build because we used a P3. 90 of the 130 companies involved from the province of Saskatchewan, that's where the money went, ladies and gentlemen. How about 800 more teachers? 800 new teaching positions in the province, that's where the money went. 40 new and replacement schools right across the province of Saskatchewan, 13 in Regina and area, that's an investment of a billion dollars. More teachers in new schools, that's where the money went. Just Some of, our, some of those that were here to greet us as we came in tonight were gathered on Elphinstone. They might be asking that rhetorical question as well. And Well, here's the answer for them. On Elfin Street, Elphinstone Street alone, here's what you'll see in answer to the question. A new Connaught School near completion. A new Sacred Heart School now built, needed years ago, 
but not, but not attended to, now open for business. A new Scott Collegiate under construction, the heart of a $45 million integrated community centre with childcare spaces, with a recreational complex and a library and a police station. That's where the money went. $1.4 billion in new health care infrastructure, 15 brand new long-term care facilities in the province of Saskatchewan, a brand new hospital for Moose Jaw, and finally the replacement of the 100-year-old Saskatchewan Hospital in North Battleford. That's where the money went. When we took office in 2007, there were two provinces in the Dominion of Canada that didn't have a children's hospital. Prince Edward Island was one and Saskatchewan was the other. And now there's only one left on that list because we went ahead with the decision to have a children's hospital for the province of Saskatchewan. And you know, the, the, the story behind that, where the money came from for that is kind of interesting. When we took office, we noted well that the government of Saskatchewan, the involuntary venture capitalists that were the taxpayers of Saskatchewan owned half of a fertilizer plant or thereabouts. Fertilizer market was doing pretty good and we kind of thought, you know, it might not be the role of government to own a fertilizer plant, but boy, it's the role of government to provide health care for kids. So we privatized our share and the other company sold, our partner sold its share as well, but we privatized that holding in the fertilizer plant and that was the 200 million of the 250 million dollars we invested to build the children's hospital and and you know when we did that privatization I mean nobody spontaneously combusted there was no we just got a children's hospital out of a commercial holding in the fertilizer business 750 more doctors Seven hundred and fifty more doctors practicing in Saskatchewan, three thousand more nurses of every designation, seven hundred and seventy more people on the front lines providing long term care for the seniors and those who are in long term care in our province, a doubling of the funding to the cancer agency, and three hundred and fifty million dollars over nine years in the surgical wait times initiative that deployed private clinics in the public system and took the longest wait lists for surgery in all of Canada under the NDP here in the home of Medicare, in the home of Tommy Douglas, to the shortest wait times in all of Canada, and that's where the money went. <laughs> 6,000 new child care spaces, a doubling of support for people with disabilities in this province, $4 billion invested in total. So, what we've been doing over the last number of years, reducing taxes, paying off operating debt, investing in quality of life and better programming and human resources and public services, has left us in reasonably good stead and not a bad position with which to deal with the fiscal situation that faces the province today. And so, we have made some difficult decisions on the strength of that foundation. Remembering that we've been short on, on, on natural resource revenue about a billion dollars per year now for three years. And we read and listened to and heard the same forecast that every other government, that every other, other industry le uh, leader uh, read about the soon and coming return to strength in commodity prices, be it potash or oil, but it was not happening. And so given all of that, we were faced with a choice in this particular budget year. Where are we going to procrastinate? Where are, we go where are we going to choose to do what so many other provinces in this country have done and kind of kick the can down the road and maybe hope the budget, you know, balanced itself or bet on skyrocketing commodity prices? Or were we going to begin to do something about it now? And not just for the short term, but for the long term. A little while ago, a friend of mine painted a word picture for me that has stuck with me ever since about this very question of choices. He said, picture a lineup at a Tim Hortons drive through and The person at the window takes his order and says, I, I'm not going to pay. The person behind me is going to pay. 
And that person takes his order at the window and says, I'm, I'm not going to pay. The woman behind me will pay. And she does the same thing. And on and on it goes until the last person in line is a 16-year-old girl. And now she's got to pay for her order and all the orders of everyone before her. You know, when it comes to the finances of this province, we are not going to do that to future generations in Saskatchewan. And if that requires difficult decisions to be made, then let us make them. Let's make them together in the interests of the future of this province. So, ladies and gentlemen, as a result of that, there's a couple of major policy shifts that are represented in this budget, some major tax shifts that are represented. First, we have began the shift away from a dependence on resource revenues. We think it's probably time to do it. Maybe it's been time to do it since oil was first discovered at Fosterton Number 1 near Swift Current. But we're going to take the occasion now to begin the process of moving away from that dependence. That's the first shift. The second shift is to move taxes away from those that impact income and investment and those job-creating forces towards consumption. That's what economists would advise that we do, and that's what historical data and experience would advise that a jurisdiction do. Now, there's not been a lot of coverage about you know, those two policy shifts that are integral to the budget that's been tabled. There's been a lot of other coverage, and I understand why. A lot of tough, tough decisions represented therein. There hasn't also been a lot of attention paid to the fact that this really wasn't about this year's budget. We tabled a three-year plan to get to balance. But more importantly, we tabled a long-term plan to further improve the competitiveness of the Saskatchewan economy, to make sure that this economy and this province are strong even as we meet the fiscal challenge that we have in the short term. Years ago, um, I remember talking to my dad about just the long-term perspective of things, and maybe it was a more of a theological discussion, but it sure has an application with respect to the budget. He said, he said picture, Brad, that you know, there's a parade going down the street, but there's a fence between you and the parade, and, and you can't, you really can't see it, except for what you could see through one little hole in that fence. When you look through that hole, you're, you're just going to see whatever part of the parade is right before you at the time, and in the case of this budget, perhaps, whatever issue is being raised at the time. That sometimes you need to rely on someone who can look over the fence or get up there, do the work, climb up a little higher and look over the fence and see the broader context. And if we were to do that with respect to this budget, here's what we would see. We would see a three-year plan to balance the budget. But more important than that, when the three years are complete, we would see a province of Saskatchewan with the lowest taxes on business of any place in Canada. We would see at the end of that three years a province that will have the lowest taxes on manufacturing and processing in Canada by quite a margin. It's all in the budget. It's all part of this plan. We would see the lowest taxes for all income groups, low, middle and high, in the country at the end, at the completion of this three-year plan. We would see, if we looked over that fence, nation-leading research and development and innovation tax incentive, the likes of the patent box that Nathan talked about, first of its kind in North America, to shelter those that are innovating and creating something new in our province from taxes until they're in a position maybe to pay them. If we were to look over that fence and look to the end of that plan, we will see that of all of the provinces that have a PST, we'll still have the lowest PST in Canada. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, if we look at the end of that plan, we will see the only province in all of Canada that doesn't have a carbon tax, because we're going to beat them in court. So there hasn't been a lot of discussion about those things, those long-term elements to the plan that was tabled when Kevin Doherty and I want to thank him for his leadership in this respect when Kevin Doherty tabled the budget in the legislature, but others have taken note of that. A couple of economists wrote in McLean's magazine shortly after we tabled the budget, Trevor Toome and Blake Schaefer wrote in a uh, under a headline in, uh, in, entitled, Saskatchewan Swallows the Fiscal Pill 
Alberta refuses, they wrote this. In dealing with low oil prices, Alberta and Saskatchewan provide a strong contrast. In one, debt is buying time. In the other, difficult choices are being made. One can certainly debate the pros and cons of each revenue and spending decision Saskatchewan made, but if not these policies, what? And if not now, when? They go on to write, there are only three ways to lower a deficit, increase revenues, decrease spending, or some combination of the two. Then there's the perspective of perhaps the most renowned tax analyst and commentator in Canada, Jack Vince. He wrote that our budget, quote, keeps spending down, starts balancing the books, and shifts taxation to less discretionary revenue sources. He goes on to say, next time this year, these budget makers could be facing a far different situation if the United States sharply reduces personal and corporate income taxes by 2018 as the Republicans plan, Saskatchewan has at least prepared itself better than Ottawa has, and, and obviously that comment was made absent the knowledge that we have today about what the Americans are going to do with respect to a carbon tax, which is they ain't going to have one. That's pretty clear. The bond rating agency, DBRS, calls the budget, quote, a determined plan to return to balance. It says the province has acknowledged the longer-term consequences of lower commodity prices and has demonstrated its willingness to make difficult but necessary decisions to address the deteriorating budget outlook. Ladies and gentlemen, making the difficult choices for the right reasons matters. Policy matters. And I think those quotes and the discussion of what our three-year plan entails, I hope anyway, highlights for you that this government, that this party has not lost sight, nor will it ever lose sight, of our North Star reference point, which has always been about growth. We have pursued in a focused and determined way policies that we believe will grow this province. The components of our growth plan have never changed. It's low taxes, competitive taxes. It's competitive regulations that are still protective of the environment. It's labor legislation that's balanced, but doesn't leave us in a competitive disadvantage. Our growth plan is still about international engagement, and it's about infrastructure investment. It hasn't changed. And neither has the reason that we focus on growth change. We have been pretty clear about that, that growth is not the end game for us. Growth is the path for us to pursue the kind of quality of life that we want for this province. The kind of health care, long-term, sustainable health care. The kind of education, long-term and sustainable. The kind of social safety net we want for the province. It's all predicated on, can we keep growing? Can we remain competitive, even at a difficult time? You know, I attended two events recently that I think highlight both of these objectives, first growth, but growth also as a means to quality of life. The first was uh, not very long ago when we got to go to the opening of a brand new potash mine. K plus S, a German company, opened Bethune potash mine. That is the uh, first new potash mine that has been opened since Elvis was not just alive but relatively healthy. Like 40 years. 40 years. And yeah, that deserves it. I'm not sure if you're clapping for Elvis or K plus S, but both are good. If there was a company on the face of the earth that we wouldn't blame for never darkening our door again, it would be K plus S. Do you know why? They were here before, ladies and gentlemen. They had a potash mine in the province of Saskatchewan before. And they were chased out of this province by the then NDP government, by its plans to expropriate its predatory policies to create a giant crown corporation, which they never really ran very well in the first place. And they were literally run out of Dodge. But they have come back now and built the first new mine in a generation. 400 permanent jobs, 2,000 construction jobs, billions invested. 
Here is what the CEO of K plus S, Norbert Steiner, said. Five years ago, when they turned the sod at the site of the new mine, with respect to them being run out of the province, he said, quote, even more than a generation later, you can hardly believe that such an act could happen in a country belonging to the Western world. Well, it did happen. And you know, in terms of policy mattering, very early on in the life of our government, I think in the first session of the Legislative Assembly that after the 2007 election, we repealed the legislation that allowed for that, for any government to undertake that kind of predatory action. It was still on the books. Some people said it was symbolic, but we had the potash companies there and we wanted to send a message that that sort of conduct would never again be acceptable in the province of Saskatchewan. And so I say to this august group assembled, we do need to be vigilant. Policies matter. And some of you might be, by, be saying, really, Brad, that never could happen again, where a government would undertake such policies. And I would respond, have you read the LEAP Manifesto? Because if you haven't, you should. The LEAP Manifesto that was sanctioned at the NDP convention and voted for by members of the Saskatchewan NDP, including those in senior levels of adv uh, uh, advisory levels, I think, and maybe organizational levels to the potential new leader of the NDP in this province, who voted for the LEAP Manifesto, that particular document basically calls for the end of what we do. No more pipelines. The impact on oil and gas and mining and forestry would be devastating. Still, you might say, really, Brad, you think that kind of stuff could happen again? Consider in Alberta just earlier this month, they took away the secret ballot for union certification votes. That's a change we made in 2007 when we decided Saskatchewan should join, I don't know, the rest of the free democratic world and allow for a secret ballot. They're going the other way there. Really, Brad, you think that stuff could happen again? Consider a national government in a country that has trade-exposed industries that pays for equalization and, and creates hundreds of thousands of jobs that is cold, that is, uh, from a population perspective, dispersed, forcing a carbon tax on those most exposed industry, risking what they call carbon leakage, when investment goes south, which is happening already, by the way, as all the companies that lined up behind the Premier of Alberta's carbon tax plan from the United States, ConocoPhillips and Royal Dutch Shell, are all down at the Permian in Texas. They've taken their money out of a country because I think there's policy risk in Canada with the carbon tax. Policies matter, and our vigilance matter. Consider what the BC, NDP, and Green Party Alliance are proposing for that province if you think this kind of thing can never happen again. They're going to increase taxes on investment, they're going to increase the carbon tax, and they're going to kill Kinder Morgan, which is mostly a, a twin line, hurting not just BC, costing them not only investment and jobs, but hurting all of Canada, hurting us in Saskatchewan. Because right now we sell our oil at our discounted North American West Texas price. If we could only get our oil to tide water, somebody, Alberta, us, someone, we know we could close the gap and get something closer to Brent. Never mind the steel workers that I work for at, over at Everaz in Regina. That company has won the contract for Kinder Morgan. Never mind the impact on them. Policies matter, ladies and gentlemen. It's important that we be vigilant, that we not assume, well, nothing like expropriating potash mines can ever happen again. You want to bet your kid's future on it? I don't, and we're not going to. So, we do need... So we're going to main, uh, remain defensive when it comes to our industries. We're going to remain vigilant in terms of the interests of the province of Saskatchewan. And we're going to be focused on those economic matters so that we can ensure there's quality of life for everyone in this province. And that takes me to the second event.
uh, that I referenced that helps describe our focus on growth, but more importantly, what growth pays for. And here's, uh, I think we're going to put some pictures up of that event. It was a much more modest event than the opening of a potash mine, but every bit as compelling. It happened at Melbourne House in my hometown of Swift Current. We opened up the ninth group home, operated by Southwest Homes, a great community-based organization in my hometown. When our government was first elected, there were two group homes in Swift Current. This was the ninth. When I was first elected, there was not a program, not a respite program for families to be able to take a little break and recharge after pouring out their heart and soul for their kids, remembering that some of these families that are raising folks with intellectual disabilities are themselves seniors. And now there is a full-time respite program uh, in Saskatchewan. And so we were there to mark the opening with Edward and Quentin and Daryl and Corey, who are the new residents of that particular group home who have a little bit more independence than they otherwise would have had. And great care from that CBO. And, and Edward and Quentin and Daryl and Corey are, are, are the reason why that potash mine opening was important. They're the reason why we might make difficult decisions now so that we can ensure this economy and this society remain strong so we can continue to make these investments. Because, you know, ladies and gentlemen, there was always a lot of talk about these issues, about the most vulnerable. And I've been a little bit more political than usual tonight, but let me just be a little bit more political, frankly and say that sometimes our opponents, especially when they're in government, they gave beautiful and eloquent speeches about the most vulnerable. But in the last years of their government, I want to tell you, you might think it's a long time ago, it isn't for these folks, because they were on a wait list. The wait list was 440 people across the province who wanted the dignity of a, of a home their families wanted respite programming and a government that actually had some resources had great speeches but not a lot of action. We see that across politics today in this country and I think, I, I hope I've been kind of hanging around long enough to make some commentary on, on, on the state of, of political discourse in Canada. We see it especially with respect to the left that there's a lot of so-called virtue signaling, right? Where you use exactly the right words whatever the latest word is, and you've got the ribbon and you fly the flag and there's an awareness day and you tweet something and you like something, maybe on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this. As a Saskatchewan party government, we will never make any claims to perfection. We will make our mistakes we have in the past, we will in the future. But we will never confuse saying the right thing with doing the right thing. And we, and we will understand with clarity that in order to do the right thing, CBOs and the government, well, we need a, a broad and robust tax base. We need a strong economy. That's how we can do more than just talk or put on a ribbon or raise a flag. And here's the good news, ladies and gentlemen. This economy has weathered this commodity price storm amazingly well. Today in Saskatchewan, there are 60,000 more jobs than there were in 2007. Today in Saskatchewan, there are 160,000 more people living here. We've grown every single quarter, including through the decline in the commodity prices, 160,000 more people living here than there were in 2007. And, and as of today, in terms of the now, Saskatchewan is leading the country in terms of growth in manufacturing sales. We're leading the country, not second, not third, leading the country in building permits. We're outpacing the nation in retail sales and wholesale trade. And obviously there are more oil wells being drilled and more service companies working in the province today. Our economy has got momentum. We will stay focused on the economy. That's what this budget is all about. Fiscal responsibility is the foundation and competitiveness for years to come. We will continue as a government to be proud of, to embrace, to foster the oil and gas sector and mining and forestry and agriculture and yes, Nathan, innovation and yes, manufacturing. We will embrace those sectors not because they need a hug, 
but because we know that's how we can provide for Quentin and Daryl and Corey and Edward now and for years into the future. We're going to focus on these things and make these difficult decisions now in support of the future of everybody in this province being better than were we to maybe take the easy route. Everyone, no matter where you live, rural or urban, north or south, no matter your income, no matter your station, no matter what you believe, no matter what you want to protest, no matter how you vote or who you love or where you came from or how long you've been here, you should be able to expect of your government that we would be unceasing in our efforts to create a Saskatchewan worthy of your vision, worthy of your ambition, worthy of your compassion. You should expect a government in this province, and trust me, you have one, that is resolved that this province, Saskatchewan, would never again become the place to be from, but that we would be, that we would remain a wonderful place, the place to be. Thanks for coming. May God bless the province of Saskatchewan.